Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Pratyush, and I'm here to talk about Zexi, which is a system for conducting uh, computations in a decentralized and private manner. This is joint work with my co-authors, Sean at Zcash, my advisor, Ale, uh, Matt at GHU, Ian, who's at Cornell Tech, but will be at uh, University of Maryland, I think, starting next year, um, and Howard, who was at Berkeley and now should be at, outside in the hall somewhere. OK, so let's get started. Um, all right, so today if you want to conduct computations on distributed ledgers, you have a number of uh, systems that you can use for this, right? You have Ethereum, you have um, Tezos, you have EOS, uh, so you have a lot of choices. Uh, but the common thing amongst all of these is that they all work by what's called re-execution. And the idea here is that uh, every node has to re-execute every transaction to check whether the transaction is valid or not, right? So you have a bunch of transactions, and every network node has to re-execute the computation in the transaction to check its validity. Okay? And this causes two problems uh, from like, scalability and privacy perspectives. From a scalability point of view, the problem is that, say, you have some computation. Um, since your network probably consists of any number of heterogeneous devices, right, which have different computing power, you're, in some sense, bottlenecked by the weakest node. Right? Every node has to re-execute the transaction, so every node has to re-execute the computation. So if you have a very slow node somewhere in the network, then you have to wait for that node to also confirm uh, the correctness of the transaction before you can you know, proceed. And uh, this is independent of any consensus layer improvements you could think of, uh, because even if you had like, the best ledger in the world that confirms everything instantaneously, you still need to check that the transaction you're proposing is actually correct. Right? So you have a scalability issue. You also have privacy issues. Now, because you know, you're sending your transaction out for people to see and execute, people need to, uh, what, what uh, nodes in the network can see is which program is being executed, right? what the data is that you're passing as input to the program, and finally, who is the caller who invoked uh, the program. And making this even worse, all this information is available on the ledger for like eternity. Um, and as techniques for de-anonymization get better, this information becomes more and more valuable and uh, harms privacy even more. All right. So what we do in Zexi is construct a system that allows users to conduct computations offline and then publish the ledger short transactions that attest to the correctness of the computation. Right. The properties that we achieve are privacy which means the transaction reveals no information about the offline computation. So all those things you saw on the previous slide, right? the uh, program that is running, the data that is input to the program, as well as the person who are the, you know, the caller, all of that information is hidden in Zexi. So that's from the privacy perspective. From the scalability perspective, what we achieve are succinct transactions. What this means is that no matter the size or you know, complexity of your offline computation, the transaction that gets published and sent out to the ledger is always you know, succinct. So concretely, in our implementation, we find that the transactions are always at most a kilobyte in size and can be verified in less than 50 milliseconds, no matter how complex the computation is. Okay. Um, okay, so that's nice so from the privacy and succinctness perspectives. But the question is, are we giving up anything in terms of you know, programmability or functionality to achieve these goals? And the answer is no, because what we achieve is uh, users can define arbitrary functions so to, in, in their transactions, so you can conduct arbitrary computations, while uh, ensuring that you know, dishonest or malicious users can't affect the uh, computations of honest users. So you can't have like a DOS attack or something, or you can't harm the privacy of other users, um, while still allowing you know, applications to interact with each other, to communicate with each other, to make you know, calls from one smart contract to another one. Okay. Um, so this is not just a theoretical uh, uh, construction. What we show in the paper is how to construct some example applications that are probably of use to people. For example, we show how to construct uh, user-defined assets which uh, attain ideal privacy guarantees, like you know, zero cash style or Zcash style privacy. We show how to extend this to support um, you know, stable coins which might have arbitrary uh, regulatory or issuance uh, properties. And finally, we also show how you can construct private decentralized exchanges, which allow you to trade uh, these kinds of assets you know, uh, in a manner that prevents harmful things like front running, which we'll see in a little bit. OK, so that's Zexi. 
In this talk, I won't be talking about you know, this general system Zexi. Instead, we'll see how we can use ideas from Zexi to construct uh, the couple of the applications that we saw. So we'll see how we can construct these private user-defined assets, which have ideal anonymity guarantees, and also how you can construct these private decentralized exchanges to trade these assets. OK, any questions so far? All right, so let's dive in. OK, so why these particular examples, right? So first, um, arguably it's the case that you know, custom user-defined assets are probably the most successful and useful application of smart contract systems today. So if our system is able to support these applications, then already we're supporting a large fraction of useful activity that goes on in these uh, smart contract systems. Okay. Um, and second, the, like, even though we're just talking about assets, it's the case that it's not just you know, we have one kind of assets and that, uh, asset and that's it. Um, if you look at even just Ethereum, you have a variety of different tokens. You have ERC20 tokens, ERC721 tokens, and you have these stable coins, which have you know, different kinds of uh, authorities which control their issuance and transactions. So if you're able to support this vast variety of, um, you know, of, of these kinds of tokens, um, then already your system is able to, uh, it, it demonstrates the expressivity of the system, right? Okay, so let's say we've achieved, you know, uh, we can, we've shown how Zexy can actually achieve this. Uh, what do people want to do once they have assets, right? They want to be able to trade them, all right? So today, the two primary mechanisms for trading assets are centralized exchanges, which involve users giving up custody of their assets to some third party, such as, I don't know, Coinbase or Kraken, uh, one of these exchanges. And the idea then is that this exchange conducts uh, any trades on behalf of the user. So, okay, so you've given up your custody to Coinbase, but this, you know, this giving up custody has caused lots of problems in the past, right? People have lost funds due to security breaches at the exchanges, you know, fraud on the part of the exchange, or just you know, plain old human error. So it's not ideal, but still these exchanges, they offer a couple of benefits, right? Uh, you, you get efficiency properties because now, if you're just trading within the, what the exchange can do instead of um, you know, having to make a trade for every trade that the user actually conducts, it can just update some entries in its local database. So you don't have to have a new on-chain transaction for every trade, right? And this also leads to improved privacy because you know, the exchange is only updating stuff in its own database, so only the exchange knows what's going on for a trade. You don't publish all the information about a trade to the larger chain. So you already have some improved privacy guarantees compared to um, you know, the naive solution. Uh, okay. So, okay, centralized exchanges are not so bad, but still people are not really fond of losing their money, right? So what people have come up with are so-called decentralized or non-custodial exchanges. And how these work is uh, users, they retain custody of their assets throughout the trading process. There is no point uh, during trading where they give up custody of their assets to a third party uh, like an exchange, okay? So this is better, so you don't, you know, only you are responsible for the security of your funds. But it also has some downsides, right? So for every decentralized exchange that we know of today, uh, you have to post an on-chain transaction whenever you make a trade. So, you know, so now your trading capacity is only as large as the trading capacity or the transaction uh, uh, throughput of the chain. Okay, so you're inefficient. But, you know, this also leads to a privacy loss because any observer can see every, uh, like the transaction for every trade, and so now they can see arbitrary trade details. Okay, so you have both scalability and privacy concerns for these decentralized uh, exchanges. Okay, so in this talk, I won't ex uh, address the scalability uh, issue. You can look at things like stock decks, which aim to directly address this, and those techniques are somewhat complementary, so you could compose our techniques for privacy, which I'll discuss next. Okay. So, focusing on the privacy drawback, what we have is, as I said, you know, in a decentralized exchange, every trade goes on the ledger. And this reveals information about the parties that are transacting and the asset uh, val uh, pairs that are being traded as well as their values. Okay, and this, you know, uh, leakage or privacy leakage has two effects. First, at a user, at like an individual user level, the issue is that you know, trading history of users goes, is publicly visible on the ledger. 
And this can reveal secrets. So first of all, it harms fungibility, right? It's not the case that uh, your, trans your assets are fungible. But also, it can leak information about you know, the individual user's proprietary trading patterns or something, which you might want to hide. Okay? So that's at the individual user level. But this privacy leakage also has ramifications um, on the global security of the system. And this is via, for example, something called front running. So what happens in front running is that a net, uh, node in the network, which has a privileged position, right? It has, it's well connected to other peers. It can receive, uh, it can look at transactions for trades before the rest of the network sees them. And then it can use this information to place orders um, based on this information, right? Uh, so for example, if I'm a miner, I can see there's a transaction for a big order coming through. Uh, what I can do is I can place my own order before prices change. Um, and then when prices do change, I can sell my coin that I got, uh, taking advantage of the price difference. Right? And this is not just a theoretical attack. Over the past uh, two, three years, there's been a series of works from the folks at IC3 that show how you can actually exploit uh, this sort of privacy leakage to actually, um, for example, even harm or uh, the stability of the underlying chain itself. Um, yeah, if you want to know more, you can take a look at Flash Boys 2.0. Uh, cool attacks that all depend, that all stem from this privacy leakage. Okay, so we want to not have this leakage, right? So our goal is to have first private user-defined assets and then private DEXs to trade these assets. Okay, so let's see how we can build these, starting with um, the first one. Okay, any questions so far? No? Okay. All right. So our starting point is the zero crash protocol because a, it's the f you know the first and I think only uh, protocol which achieves you know the strongest possible privacy guarantees and also because it serves as the building block for our construction that we'll see. Okay. So what happens in zero cash is that each transaction consumes old coins and produces new ones, right? And within each transaction, you have serial numbers that correspond to the consumed coins and new coin commitments that correspond to the created coins. And the properties that zero cash guarantees is that there's no way to link the transaction that created a coin with the transaction that spends it. So here we have, um, you know, the, in the, the coin created in the first transaction is spent in the last transaction. But the point is that serial number five is in no way linkable to the commitment B for that coin, right? So you have some sort of ideal privacy guarantee while ensuring that you know, value is conserved, so you're not making money out of thin air. In just a tiny bit more detail, uh, formally the guarantee that we're giving is that the anonymity set for a transaction is the set of all possible uh, coins in the past, right? So the serial number, it can come, it can correspond to any of the coin commitments that have appeared on the ledger before, which is, you know, the best possible anonymity set that you could hope for. Okay. So this is like a good target to aim for, right? You know, the best possible privacy. Um, so let's take a little bit uh, deeper look at how the zero cash paradigm works, like a very whirlwind overview. Okay. So as I said, each transaction contains serial numbers corresponding to the old coins, right? And new coin commitments corresponding to the, uh, to the coins that are created in the transaction, okay? Uh, what the verifier, what the ledger does, or what the network nodes do when verifying this transaction is making sure that the serial numbers that appear in the transaction are not duplicate. They don't already, you know, they weren't included in some past transaction. And this prevents double spending, okay? So, okay, so that's what the transaction contains. It also contains uh, zero-knowledge proof, which asserts some properties about the old coin serial numbers and the new coin commitments, okay? So what it proves first is that each coin has this structure. Um, you know, it consists of a public key, some value, and some other information, not super important. And what it first asserts is that the old coins that you're spending in the transaction actually exist. And it does this via a proof of membership in a commitment Merkle tree. The idea is that whenever you add a new transaction to the ledger, the commitments get added to some sort of global Merk uh, Merkle tree over the commitments. And then when you want to spend the, the, the coin, you have to prove that it exists by proving its membership in the Merkle tree. Okay? And you do that via the proof. Okay, so that's step one, proving that the coins that you're spending actually exist and aren't coming out of thin air. Okay? 
So the next step is to prove that the serial numbers for the coins that you're spending are actually derived correctly. Um, you know, if I can just make up serial numbers as I want, then I can, you know, double spend as I want because the serial numbers will never be duplicate. So the proof asserts that the serial numbers are derived correctly. Okay, so that's stuff with the old coin. And finally, for the new coins, it asserts that they're constructed correctly, that the commitment for the new coins corresponds to, you know, some public key, some value, and some row thingy that we won't care about. Okay. So what we've done is we've shown that the old coins exist, that they are not being double spent, um, and that the new coin commitments are constructed correctly. And finally, what we want to show is that, you know, we're not making money out of thin air. So what the proof asserts is that the input value is equal to the output value, right? We're not making money out of thin air. Okay, this is a pretty heavy slide. Any questions? No? Yeah. Yeah, so you have to prove that you know, the values are integers of, say, 64 bits or whatever. And uh, when you add these as integers, then the value is conserved. Yeah, so it's inside. That's implicit in the SNARK. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, so you have two steps. First, you prove that the old coins exist. And then in, in like another step, you prove that the serial numbers are derived correctly. And then outside the zero knowledge proof, you check that the serial numbers are not duplicated across past transactions. Okay, maybe, okay, uh, we'll take, uh, over the next slides, maybe your question will be answered. I'm not sure how much time I have. Okay, so let's go forward. Okay, so as I said, zero cash achieves idle privacy or idle anonymity for a single asset on a single blockchain. Our goal is idle privacy for multiple assets on the same blockchain, right? Now, one approach to this would be to just say, okay, I have assets A, B, C. Let me just run the zero cash protocol independently for A, B, C. So I'll have zero cash A, zero cash B, and zero cash C. So the problem with this is that, you know, you're partitioning your anonymity set. If, for example, your asset C doesn't have too much traffic, whenever you see a transaction for zero cash C, you'll know that asset C is being traded. And what you ideally want is it like, nobody can tell whether you're trading A or B or C, or like what values you're trading within A, B, C. Right? So you want all of them, like all the assets in the chain to share the same anonymity pool. Okay, so to achieve that, what we can do is you know, take our zero cash construction and modify it a tiny bit. Now inside the coin, instead of just storing the value, we'll also store the asset identifier and uh, the, the value. So we have the values before, but also the asset ID. And what we do, instead of just asserting that value is conserved, we assert that for every asset in the transaction, the value for that specific asset is conserved, right? So if you have two assets, asset A and asset B, uh, for the input coins, what the proof will assert is that, you know, the value of asset A in the transaction is conserved and the value of asset B in the transaction is conserved. Okay. And the nice, oh, sorry. And the nice thing here is that because, um, you know, zero knowledge proof is zero knowledge, you don't, the transaction itself reveals no information about the assets involved in the transaction or the values involved or the sender or the receiver. All that information is hidden. So all, you know, another node that's looking at the opaque transaction on top, all they'll see is that some serial numbers are produced, some commitments are, are, are there, uh, there's a zero knowledge proof. Uh, so they won't learn anything about the concrete assets or the values, but they will know that you know value is conserved and we're not making money out of thin air because of the soundness of the of the zero knowledge proof. Okay. So so far, what we've done, this is that that was it. So that now we have multiple user-defined assets in the same transaction uh, with the same anonymity pool, so on the same blockchain. Okay, so that's like one step. All right. But the problem with this is that, you know, assets are still isolated. There's no way really for them to interact. There's no programmability anywhere in, in, in the equation. So let's see how we can generalize that construction to support um, uh, programmability, for example. So you want applications that interact with multiple assets. For example, your DEX, you know, it needs to interact across assets. So let's see how we can do that. Okay, so. We have um, the same picture as before. We have our ID and value inside the coin, but we also now store some additional application-dependent information, right? So you can just put arbitrary data in there. 
Um, and what we do is, along with asserting that uh, you know, the value for each asset is conserved, what we also assert is that first, okay, first we store inside each coin also a death predicate. And you can think of these death predicates basically as the Bitcoin script. So whenever, whenever you want to spend a coin that is associated with the script, you first have to satisfy the script, right? So similarly here, along with asserting that the value is conserved, we assert that for every coin that is consumed in the transaction, its corresponding predicate is also satisfied, right? So this is like just, you know, you can, mental picture of this is basically you have now private Bitcoin scripts, um, but, you know, supporting arbitrary computation. So not just whatever is in Bitcoin script. So you can enforce arbitrary uh, conditions, right? Um, okay. All right. So the nice thing again now is that transactions reveal no information about the asset identifier, the value, or even the predicate. So I could put arbitrary computation in there, and nobody in the outside world would know what computation occurred because of the zero-knowledge property of the proof system. Okay. Yeah. So how we get around this is by having um, actually a step of recursion, proof recursion. So instead of checking the predicate itself there, we check a proof that the predicate is satisfied. Um, so you wouldn't have, like the global parameters would just be, instead of checking, you know, like one for every predicate, you would have one thing which just checks a proof which has this particular shape is satisfied. Okay, maybe I can answer more questions after that. Yeah, that's an interesting topic. Okay. So, so we have these predicates inside our system. So these are like Bitcoin scripts. How would we use them in, in an application? Like how would we use them to construct a DEX, right? So the first step would be to, let's, let's see how we can construct atomic swaps. And these are important because, you know, they're the key primitive for constructing DEXs. So you don't want it to be the case that when you're trading with somebody that they take your coins, but you don't get your asset in return. So you want to, your swap to be atomic, right? So let's see how we can do that. So we have a coin that we want to exchange for some other coin, right, for some other asset. And to do that, we set its predicate to be this exchange death predicate. And what that looks like is, so let's, say, let's imagine that our coin is part of a transaction. What our exchange death predicate will check is that it'll first look inside our coin and, and try to figure out, okay, I want to trade C1 old for a coin which has asset ID star, a value V star, and goes to public key PK star. So, okay, so now we know which asset we want to trade for, okay? What we'll do is we'll check the other input coin in the transaction and see if its asset and value match the, the ones that we want, right? So we'll check that ID2 old is equal to V star and similarly for the value, okay? So once this condition, if this condition passes, we'll go ahead and perform the swap. So we'll make sure the output coins have, you know, the correct value and ID. And we'll check that their addresses are also correct. Okay, so that, uh, you know, the output coins are going to the correct parties. They're not going to, uh, you know, arbitrary people. Okay, so this is all what the death predicate asserts. So we'll check that, you know, it'll look inside the old coin, see, okay, this is a coin that I want in exchange. It'll check that the other input coin actually satisfies its conditions, and then it'll perform the swap. Okay, it's a very simple, this three-step process, basically. In, there's actually a little bit more details, but uh, you can look at the paper if you want to know more. Okay, all right. So for our decks, now we have one, you know, part of it, but there's a couple of other things that you want to do. You want to be able to, like, you know, discover orders and create orders and finalize trades once you've done all these things. All right, so let's take a very quick look at how you would do this. Um, so there's a couple of DEX architectures. In the interest of time, I won't cover the first, right? But instead, and what I'll be talking about in this talk is so-called index-based architectures. Here, there's a you know, public index which maintains a list of intentions to trade. And these just consist of asset pairs. Um, so if I want to trade, what I can do is I can go and say, okay, I want to trade A for B. Uh, there, there's no values there, only the names of the assets that you want to trade, okay? Uh, so this is published by a maker. The taker can then come along and interact with the maker and decide whether or not they want to fill the order. Um, and examples of this include S-Swap. So S-Swap is a sort of index-based uh, DEX. Okay, so let's see a little bit more how this works. So you have your index, you have a maker who comes along and says, okay, I want to sell A and buy B, and please contact me at this encryption public key. So this is a key for uh, uh, private communication, okay? 
um, the taker can come along, see this entry, and decide, oh, okay, this looks good to me. Um, and then they can interact securely via that encryption public key, agree on the terms of the deal, so they'll agree, okay, your rate is so-and-so, so I agree with this rate. And then what they can do is they can, the taker can publish, uh, can create a transaction that completes the swap. So this is in the non-private case, okay? This is like how this works, for example, in AirSwap. And then publish this to the ledger, okay? The problem with this is that, because again, as we're working in the non-private case, once the transaction is published to the ledger, anybody can see the details of the trade, and so your miners can do front running, you lose fungibility, all those nasty things. Okay, so let's see how we would want to modify this in the private case, right? So you have, as before, the same index, the maker can come along, put its intention on the thing, um, they interact, uh, they agree on the rates they want to exchange, and now, this is, a, this is where we get, this is where, uh, you know, the privacy comes in. The makers creates a coin which has the terms of the trade. So it'll be like, I want to trade, uh, you know, A, uh, okay. I, I have a coin of type A and value VA, and I want to trade it for a coin of B with value VB. So it'll send along this coin along with the secret key for spending the coin to the taker. The taker will, assuming the taker has a coin which satisfies the trade conditions, the taker can go ahead and produce the transaction that we saw earlier, right, with the serial numbers and commitments and proof, and publish just the ledger, okay? And the nice thing is that now, because the transaction hides all information about the asset values and the asset ID and the predicate and everything, right, we get two properties. We get trade anonymity, which says that all information about the maker and taker is hidden, so we're hiding details of uh, the maker and taker, and we also hide information about the asset pairs that are being traded. And why are these useful? Uh, because the first one preserves the financial privacy of the user, right? You're hiding the uh, transaction graph. And the second one helps prevent front running because now the transaction includes no information about the values or even the assets being traded, so it can't do any front running, it can't like, it doesn't have any privileged information that it could use, right? Okay, so together these two properties, they solve our privacy concerns that we had earlier for the user level financial privacy as well as the uh, global you know, front running problem. Okay, all right, so that's it uh, for this talk. So in this talk, we saw how to construct these private user-defined assets. We saw how we can use these predicates to program access to uh, these user-defined assets, and then we saw how we can use this programmability to construct a private DEX. Uh, what you'll see, what you can find in the paper is, you know, a lot more. <laughs> so you can find, we, what we do in the paper is we formally model sort of this programming uh, model where, you know, you have death predicates and Bitcoin scripts and they're flying around, um, and how to compute on, you know, these individual coins or records uh, as individual units of data. Then we show how to realize this with strong privacy guarantees with a cryptographic primitive. Uh, and finally, we have an implementation that um, you know, leverages cool techniques from SNARKs and recursive composition of SNARKs and efficient circuit design uh, to get you know, the numbers that I showed you on one of the earlier slides, you know, one kilobyte transactions and uh, tiny proof sizes, uh, tiny verification times. Okay, so the code is available online. If you want to take a look, play around with it, uh, please go ahead. And thanks. Yeah, the paper is also available online. Uh, yeah. Have you considered using this approach with trading pairs? that involve assets existing on different, on separate blockchains? So you could, but um, then the privacy guarantees that you get depend on like the privacy characteristics of both blockchains. So if both blockchains, for example, are running a variant of the Zexi protocol, then you can get some sort of cross-chain privacy as well. But uh, it depends, like if only one, if one chain is just Bitcoin, the other chain is actually um, you know, running the Zexi protocol, then you can get one-sided privacy in some sense. Okay.